Welcome into a hump day edition of Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked on Sports Atlanta. Today on the show, we need to get the Falcons' pass defense cranked up and going. Will Snitker do the right thing with the rotation? And we'll talk to my friend Gabe Burns from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. We'll go through all things Atlanta Braves. It's all next, Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked on Sports Atlanta. This is Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, part of Locked on Sports Atlanta. And it starts now. We welcome you into this hump day edition of Hitting Hard with John Chuck. We're here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Head to YouTube.com, put Locked On Sports Atlanta in the search browser. Hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment. We are free and available on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Download us today. Leave us a five-star review. Amazon Fire and Roku. You can find us on those platforms now as well. And, of course, at JMCH316 is my Twitter page, if you would give me a follow there. We've kind of known that the Falcons' pass defense over these last couple of weeks has not been all that great, right? And we talked a little bit about picking on A.J. Terrell and things like that. Now we have some numbers to give us some sort of perspective, at least through the first couple of weeks of the NFL season, where the Falcons are at. So here are the numbers, if you will, maestro. Um, the Falcons have given up the seventh most completions in the NFL through the first couple of weeks. The Falcons have also given up the fourth highest completion percentage through the first couple of weeks. They are tied for the ninth highest most yards per attempt. They've given up the 11th most yards in the NFL. They're tied for giving up the fourth most touchdown passes. They're also tied for fifth in giving up the most first downs through the pass in the NFL. Now, the good news is they have five sacks. So that ties them for 12th right now. The interesting thing that I think a lot of people forget, you know the Falcons had four sacks through their first two games last year. Did you know that? You remember that? For a team that only had 18 sacks, think about that. They had four sacks through their first team two games, and then for their final 15 games, only found 14 more sacks. So we've seen a nice start to the pass rush even last year. Now, do I think this year's pass rush is going to fade and go into oblivion? No, I think we're much better equipped. You know why? Because we don't have the vagabonds like Stephen Means and Dante Fowler and guys like that running around that just muck your defense up, put your defense in quicksand. So I feel better about the pass rush, even though we're about the same stead where we were last year. Now. The Falcons secondary this past weekend, if we get into the analytic, sabermetric, metrosexual stats that people like, we get in the pro football focus world. The Falcons secondary ranked 28th in the NFL last week. And for the season, A.J. Terrell's pro football focus grade is 57.1. Last year was in the 80s. Casey Hayward's pro football focus grade is 62.3. Now, the good news about those guys is that we are coming up with some interceptions. So we are creating some turnovers. We've been creating sacks in the in the passing game. But if you think about the fact, A.J. Terrell has given up the eighth most receptions when he's in his target zone. And that's 10 total receptions that he's given up. Why that's an interesting stat is last year, A.J. Terrell for the entire season only gave up 29 receptions when targeted in his zone. And he's already given up 10 this year. Good news is Casey Hayward has been pretty good. He's only 56 as far as receptions allowed in his zone. So look, what does all of this mean? Simple. We got to be better against the pass. Part of that comes from your pass rush, right? I don't care how great your corners are. If you can't sack the quarterback, it's tough to be really good. And last year, A.J. Terrell was so good with nobody on the other side that you could crush the other side of the field where A.J. Terrell wasn't standing. Now, we'll talk more about this in just a second. But first, let me talk about my friends over at BetOnline.net. Listen, we're neck deep in it now. We're in football season all the way, college, pro. We got MMA, boxing, golf. And don't look now, baseball postseason is just a few weeks away from getting cranked up. You want to be smarter. You want to have better information when it comes to your sports wagering. 
BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports wagering information. You need e-scores, betting information, lines, odds, spreads, podcast news, fantasy, whatever you need. Everything is right at your fingertips at BetOnline.net. Take that mobile device. It's not easier than this. Take the mobile device that you've got, okay, and put in BetOnline.net and go there today and check out all of the information that they have to make you smarter when it comes to getting into sports wagering. BetOnline.net is your number one source for your sports wagering information, and it's where the game starts. So your secondary obviously has to start with its pass rush, which I feel like we're better. If we can get consistent pressure on quarterbacks, you will most definitely not only help your secondary in coverage, but like you've seen in these first couple of weeks, you force quarterbacks to have to release the football quicker make quicker throws, tougher throws, less accurate throws. So I think that, am I worried about the Falcons' pass defense through the first couple of weeks? Not really. And if you look coming up this week, and we'll preview the game when we get to Friday, the the Seahawks are, I think, the best rushing team in the NFL. They're they're right near the top in most all of the rushing statistics, right? You don't want to put the ball in Geno Smith's hand to throw it 40 sometimes. But... You know, you get back from that, you come back home. I know Jacoby Brissett and that Nick Chubb-led rushing attack, but they still have Amari Cooper and guys like that. And then, oh, yeah, it's down to Tampa. And I can assure you that dude down there is going to huck it around. So we need to start to see some steady improvement in the Falcons' pass defense. You know, most of the numbers are pretty good all the way around, but it's too many completions, too high a percentage, too many first downs still, with this passing attack. And it's been interesting because you're seeing teams that are not afraid to go after and target A.J. Terrell. Now, maybe part of that is because a lot of teams do respect Casey Hayward, and it's pick your poison, right? Because last year, when it's A.J. Terrell on one side and Fabian Moreau on the other, that's a no-brainer. That's the biggest no-brainer in the history of mankind. I'll throw it all day at Fabian Moreau's side, and I know I'm going to have huge success there because I got a special teams player that's playing corner. Hence, some of the numbers. So no doubt about it that A.J. Terrell benefited from the fact that teams weren't willing to throw for him, against him, I should say. Now you're starting to see that numbers kind of spread a little bit more evenly. I love our two corners. We talked again. This is the best two corners the Falcons have had. Maybe, again, what do we say? Ashley Ambrose and Ray Buchanan, you know, coming off the Super Bowl year in 98. It's been a long time since we felt like we've had two cover, cover corners like this. And I think both guys will continue to adjust. Again, the pro football focus grades aren't necessarily where you want to be, but that doesn't tell the whole story. If the Falcons can find their consistent pass rush and they can continue to dial it up against quarterbacks and sack the quarterback and you change up down in distance to where teams are going to have to throw, part of it too is play with a lead. You also make your life easier if you can play with a lead in the NFL, you know, where teams have to come back on you. So there are some numbers that have to change and get better for the Falcons pass defense. Am I panicked or worried? No, but it's certainly, I don't think the start that we thought even a couple of games in that Casey Hayward and AJ Terrell would have, they don't grade out very high. They've been picked on Terrell, especially has been picked on and I'll give Michael Thomas and Jameis Winston credit. They did a good job. And I'll give Matt Stafford and Cooper Cup credit. Very few people in the NFL stop Cooper Cup. There's a reason why he was the Offensive Player of the Year and the Super Bowl MVP and had the greatest season ever for a wide receiver. So one area of the defense to focus in on over these next few weeks as it's Seattle, the Browns, and at Tampa Bay is getting that pass defense better, getting these corners, getting getting more into that shutdown mode that we thought was coming for them. All right, when we come back, will Snitker do the right thing with the rotation? We'll talk about that next. Hitting Hard with John Chuckery, Locked On Sports. Back on Hitting Hard with John Chuckery here on Locked On Sports Atlanta. Head to YouTube, put Locked On Sports Atlanta in the search browser. Hit that subscribe button, leave us a comment. We are free and available on all of your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. And, of course, Amazon Fire and Roku now is where we can be found. Hit us up there at JMSH316 on my Twitter page. Look, there's two separate discussions to have. I know Zeno's been talking a lot about Spencer Strider has to be the number two in this and the other. There's a difference, though, in the Braves world. And you can like this, not like this, but I'm just telling you what the truth is, okay? 
There is what should be done and what will Snitker do, right? If everybody's got all those, you know, bands on and stuff like that, the rubber things around their wrist and all that stuff, you know, uh, WWSD, what would Snitker do? Because that has to be factored in. Now, look, Spencer Strider has been outstanding. And I have no issues or no qualms with the idea of saying he should be the number two starter. He's deserved it. He's got swing and miss stuff. He's got all the analytical stuff that you could want for that number two starter. Max Fried, to me, is your ace. He is your proven track record ace. Regular season, playoffs, everything. So I'm handing him the ball in game one. Plus, he's a left-handed starter. I think there is something about that, too. But he's your ace. So I'm not taking the ball out of his hands for a game one in a playoff, especially in a short series where that first game can be all the difference in the world. And I'll get into that about the Snitker factor on everything. But I have no problem handing the ball to Spencer Strider in game two. But since you don't manage the team, I don't manage the team, Zeno doesn't manage the team, the question becomes, will Snitker do that? So last year, obviously, look, it wasn't that Freed was bad, and there wasn't a whole lot of difference between what Max Freed was and what Charlie Morton was. In 2020, Max Freed was your best pitcher and one of the best pitchers in all of Major League Baseball, and he got the ball in game one of all the series, right? Now, Freed didn't start off well last year, but by the end of last year, he was as good as anybody in baseball. Go look at his numbers in the second half of the season. He was outstanding last year in the second half. Of the, he was almost unhittable in the second half of last year. But Snicker gave Charlie Morton the ball. Not that that was a wrong decision or anything like that, but he trusts the veteran. Go back a few years in time, the Cardinals series, where Mike Soroka had a monster year, his best year by far in the majors, the last time we really saw him be that effective. And he had the best adjusted ERA in Major League Baseball. If you factor in ballparks and things like that, not just raw ERA, but if you take ballpark factors and things like that in where you're pitching, he had the best adjusted ERA in Major League Baseball. What did Snitker do? He went with the Bulldog. And I don't mean D-A-W-G, just the D-O-G, Dallas Keuchel. And he pitched him multiple starts in that short series against the Cardinals, and the Braves didn't win either game. Remember, Morton pitched game one of the Brewer series last year, and he didn't win that game. So I got no issue with Strider being number two. That That's not where this discussion is. I don't think it's really a matter of discussing does he deserve or not deserve. Yeah, it's it's there's no reason not to have that kind of case for Spencer Strider. You know, look, Kyle Wright had the big relief appearance last year in the playoffs, right, in the World Series that, that was huge. But when you talk about what Strider's meant to this team and what his stuff is and all that, it's not much of an argument. But that's not what it is. The argument is, what will Snitker do? Now, we'll talk more about this in just a second. But first, let me talk about my friends over at Coffee AM. Listen, the best small batch coffee roaster in America, you know, they're right here in the state of Georgia, up in the Canton area. I want you to head to coffeeam.com backslash locked on. Coffeeam.com backslash locked on. Go through their menu. You need K-Cups, they got it. You want organic coffee, they got it. You want flavored coffee, they got it. You need tea, they got that. You need a gift set. I got a party coming up, whatever like that. I want to celebrate the Braves now making the playoffs. Cool, here's a gift set that's available. So go through coffeeam.com's menu of products today. And when you get that first order put together, put the coupon code locked on at checkout, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N, locked on at checkout, and you get 15% off your first order. 15% off simply by using locked on as the promo code at checkout. Coffeeam.com. They are the best small batch coffee roaster in America. Love those folks. So again, it's the what will Snitker do factor in, in all of this, right? I mean, that's that's what this comes down to. Now, if you say that Strider, you know, for instance, if they're the wild card team, you're going to play a three game series, right? In the wild card round, best two out of three. All right, Freed's going to get a start. You're only going to have three starters at that point. You'll certainly will need a four star. So when, once you get to the divisional round, championship round, World Series, okay, then you got to have four starters. Then, then that's easy because it's Freed, Wright, Strider, Morton. We're good there. 
Ian Anderson's not pitching the rest of this year. We don't have to worry about that. We're not going to worry about Oda Rizzi making a start or anything like that, right? We got our four guys. And, you know, look, the way the baseball schedule is, it's not a whole lot of off time and things like that in between road trips and all that. But that will be the easy part. But I, look, Max Fried will be game one. What he does game two will be interesting. Should he pitch Strider game two? Yeah. Now, if he goes with Kyle Wright, who's going to have 20, 21 wins and a barely three ERA or below, that's not exactly like he's trotting out, with all due respect, Dallas Keuchel, who at best was mediocre that year for the Braves. At, be I'll, at, at best, he was a mediocre pitcher. He sure as hell wasn't as good as what Mike Soroka was that year. That should have been a no-brainer. This is where you hope that Snitker has learned about managing the roster as far as what to do. Snicker was obviously terrific last year in the playoffs. And you have to trust and believe in whatever decision that he makes. Again, these are first world problems to have. These are good things to have. When I have to pick between who should be the co-rookie of the year and maybe the only 20-game winner in Major League Baseball, those are good decisions to have. All right? Whew. I'm going to eat steak tonight. Do I want New York strip or filet mignon? Right? Those are good decisions to have in life. Not, you know what? I ain't got money for groceries. It's either tuna helper or, you know, macaroni helper. So these are first world problems that Brian Snicker has to deal with. Obviously, in a short series, it will be Strider, Wright, and Free. That will be the three guys. I don't think Morton is going to pitch in that. If he does, it'll be a surprise, I think. And look, Morton is getting some things figured out. I thought he pitched pretty well last night. He's going to be a 200 strikeout pitcher. I think I don't think people really appreciate Morton's career and the numbers that he's put up for his whole career. Tampa, Braves, Pittsburgh, everywhere else that, that he's been. But he'll certainly get his shot in the next, you know, you get through the wild card round, or if you end up winning the division and end up with one of the top two or three seeds, then you know you you, you won't have to play in that first round. But either way. Will Strider get the ball in game two? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't think it's as simple as just saying, well, he deserves it. Sure. I don't have a problem arguing that case. I'll back you on that. But the manager has his things that he likes. What have we always said about Brian Snicker? The greatest attribute that he has, his loyalty, is also his biggest fault when it comes to handling players. I'll give Snicker the benefit of the doubt. I'll trust in that whatever decision. If he pitches Kyle Wright in a game two, Strider, fine. At the end of the day, you know, the Braves have one of the best rotations in baseball. If I have Strider, Freed, and Kyle Wright, I'm good to go. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk to our buddy Gabe Burns. going to talk some more Braves baseball with him, feature writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He'll help me break it all down. Hitting hard with John Chuckery, locked on sports. Welcome into Hitting Hard with John Chuck right here on Locked on Sports Atlanta. YouTube.com is where you put Locked on Sports Atlanta into your search browser. Hit that subscribe button. Leave us a comment. We're free and available. All your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Download us there today. Leave us a five-star review. Roku and Amazon Fire is also where you can find us now. And, of course, follow me at JMCH316. Well, we head down the stretch here as the uh, Atlanta Braves still battling for that division lead with the Mets. Only a handful of games left before we get into playoff baseball. We are joined by my friend Gabe Burns, the feature writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, covers Braves and everything for the AJC. AJC.com is where you can check out all of Gabe's work and follow him on his Twitter page, at Gabe Burns AJC. And Gabe, let me start with this. I, I, I will go hot take right out of the box. Base, the Major Leagues, Major League Baseball should step in right now and tell the Baseball Writers Association of America to give Strider and Harris both the Rookie of the Year award. Because here's the thing. I don't think there's a compelling case as to why one of those guys should finish second in the Rookie of the Year voting. I I agree. I'm glad I'm not voting on it. I I, I mean I mean seriously, man. Like, I, because naturally, when we have these conversations, we end up tearing down the other guy that you're arguing against, right? We we're seeing it like people are tearing down Otani 
to argue for Judge. And I know right. everyone always goes, oh, well, you don't have to do that. But that's always how this discourse mm -hmm. ends up going. I don't see how you can tear down Harris or Strider. I really don't. Uh, Harris is obviously just a superb all-star caliber center fielder right out of the gate, 300 hitter. I know nobody cares about average, but still. And Strider, I mean, this guy is an immediate ace. He has been, I mean, he was great in the bullpen. They move him into the rotation, which, as we remember, was a legit conversation. Should they do this? You know, we're looking at that. And now he's, I mean, he set, he set the franchise record for strikeouts in a game. He's got 200 Ks. It's just ridiculous what he's been able to do. Uh, how big both of these guys have been for this team. You can't say enough about what Harris has done solidifying that spot, what Strider has done in the position that this rotation is in. It's a better position than it's certainly been in in recent years. So uh, it's, it's kind of weird that we have to argue against one of these guys or rather just argue more for another because both of them have been so invaluable to one of the best teams, and uh, I, would, I would hate to pick between them. Obviously, one of the things that sucked Gabe was Ozzy Albies coming back and then breaking his finger. You know, obviously his regular season is done. They're going to reevaluate him. What do you think the reality of him coming back for the playoffs? I, I, one good thing about the playoffs is you can manipulate your roster in each round of the playoffs. So even if, for instance, he's not ready for the, the divisional round or whatever, you know, whatever wild card, whatever first round is, you can bring him back later on, but what's the reality that he's going to be ready to just come back and play in the playoffs and, and help this team contribute coming off that injury? Yeah. I, you know, I wish I had an answer there. Uh, it's, it's also one of those things too, where, you know, if Vaughn is playing well, if he's helped, helped you win a postseason series, I mean, Again, you're going to risk it and bring, you know, bring Ozzy and start him immediately and not knowing how he's going to look. If there's going to be some rust, you can't afford rust in the postseason, obviously. Right. So, I, I mean, look, I mean, if he's going to be a guy off your bench, too, there's different ways that you can look at this. But, and look, frankly, they might not be playing deep enough for it to matter. You never know. It, it, MLB postseason is weird. We're all expecting them to be in the NLCS again, or, you know, they run to the Dodgers and the NLDS, who knows. But, uh, it's a it's such a bummer for Ozzy, a guy that spends you know he misses eighty one games, spends three months coming back, and just like that, you're done again. And I, I understand they're leaving the door open for the postseason, but there's just so many factors; it's really impossible to say until we get there. How do we evaluate Matt Olson this year? I mean, on one hand, it's thirty and a hundred is what it's going to be. On the other hand, he's had some really funky stretches. This month, obviously, in September, has really been a disaster. I mean, it, it's been really bad coming down the stretch when you need him to step it up most. On one hand, I'll take 30 and 100. On the other hand, the, the, the ups and downs. And he does defensive war come out with a negative rating. I mean, granted, it's a minus 0.3 but it's not like he's a three defensive war rating either this year. How do we evaluate what he's been or done for the Braves this year? Well, I mean, you summed it up well as far as there's been a lot of good and some disappointing. I think the the defensive element of this has been underwhelming. There's no question. Like this, I mean, we we knew that this was a really high level defender coming in, and he would be the first to tell you this is this has not been his best defensive year. There's there's been quite a few gaffes and. But again, like larger sample, you look at the guy's career, it's not really something I'm worried about. But the, I mean, it's just been, yeah, it's just been a disappointing year from that perspective. Offensively, it's been weird. I mean, look, you said it, September was, it's been brutal. Uh, two hit, he had two hits on uh, Monday. You know, maybe that ends up getting him going a little bit. He needs it. They need to get him rolling before the postseason. But look, I mean, I hate to bring up Freddie again. Uh, because we've really just hammered that point home. But the reality was that Freddie was just so consistent and just you knew what you were going to get. And we knew, everybody knew, Olsen coming in, it was just not going to be that same level of just steadiness. And that's okay because very few players have that. And Olsen is a superb player in his own right. And and people wanted to argue he's better than Freddie. Maybe, maybe over the long term he is. That's fine. But – it it's been interesting to kind of watch him just figuring everything out. And look, 
at the beginning of the year too. I mean, this is a guy who you got, he gets a big contract. He's coming home. There's a lot of factors there. I, offensively, I would say it's been fine. Defensively, a little underwhelming and, I'm not, but I'm not worried about him in the slightest. He's he's fine. He's, he's had a nice year. Uh, I am very curious to see uh, the second year that he winds up putting together, but we're nowhere close to that yet. One guy who I think is going to be interesting to watch with how he's using the playoffs is going to be William Contreras because normally in the playoffs, look, even in the Braves history, you know, even Javi Lopez in his prime, you know, he would get that day where, you know, somebody else would catch Greg Maddox, right? And and you get that day off and this, then the other. Playoffs, you don't typically swap your catchers. You don't typically split your catchers up and things like that. And I know they obviously have the DH, but again, we're talking about if Ozzy comes back and you've got all these other guys that you have to think about putting in the mix and stuff like that. How do you think Contreras in the playoffs gets used? Do you think that Snit will split the catching duties? Or do you think that Contreras is mostly going to have to DH in the playoffs? I think he's mostly going to DH. And I think that this is even clearer now that we have Ronald handling himself fine in right field. And we don't have the Grissom, Ozzy, you know, log jam that we, we thought right. we were going to have. So right. now you have Grissom. Okay, you have Grissom Manning second. You have Acuna in the outfield. And then that frees you up to have Contreras as the DH. And we saw how much Snit – you know, relied on Travis a year ago. So I, th my expectation is you're going to see Travis catching and you're going to see uh, Contreras as DH. Because, again, these guys praise Contreras, his improvement defensively, his improvement in game planning. All of that is true, but it's the postseason. No one cares about somebody's development. You're the best. You are at your best when Travis is your catcher and then you have William as your DH. And, by the way, William has had – a great year. I'm actually writing about this. It almost feels like he's been underrated. Mm -hmm. This guy, it, and it's weird because he's a backup and he's also an all-star. So he's already kind of just a weird zone we don't see very often. And for a guy to be 24 and doing this, if he was doing this on another team, he would probably get a lot more attention. But being a 24-year-old doing awesome things on this team is I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing here. We're used to 21 year olds doing it. So, so I, I will say, I, I hope that maybe it takes him doing something in the postseason, or, or maybe it's just a more exposure, but I really think he's had an under underrated year. And I, I would really like to see some more appreciation toward that because he's the development that he has taken and, and the job that he's doing has been awesome. Well, let, let's talk about that for just a second, because, this is this to me is the big story about the Braves this year too is the defending World Series champion that that brought back most everybody right but even losing Freddie you went out and got an All Star caliber Gold Glove defensive first baseman right so it's not like you replaced him with Sid Bream at, at first base or something right but Strider Harris Contreras Kyle Wright I mean you think about all the contributions that guys that from that guys that weren't really contributors last year or weren't even on the roster last year to contribute. That's the amazing part about the Atlanta Braves this year to me is it's not just Ronnie and Riley and these guys, all of the contributions that your rookies and the Contreras and the Kyle Wrights. That to me is the story that a defending world series champion has this many young guys coming in and contributing heavily to their success this year. You know, we talked all through last October about how you need some luck and you need some things to break your way. This year's Braves team, I don't I don't think luck is honestly, it's not the right word because there's a reason that so many young guys continue to do this for this franchise. Clearly they're doing something right in player development, mm -hmm. they're doing yeah. something right they're with their scouting atmosphere. and everything. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean from the from that to just the way Snit handles a clubhouse to the way that guys like Freed and Travis Darno handle, you know, the way they treat 21-year-olds. There's just there's so much that goes into it. So it's not necessarily luck, but there is an element there. And when you – because they didn't plan on Contreras being their backup catcher this year anyway because they signed Manny Pena to a nice right, two-year right. deal. He's your backup catcher. So the, the intention was not – the the intention was not for Strider to be in the rotation. Michael Harris was not supposed to be your center fielder. Von Grissom probably wasn't even supposed to be up here. Mm -hmm. um, and if he did, it was going to be a September deal. Uh, so 
credit to these players for putting themselves in this position and producing enough. Because we've seen guys, I mean, like how many times do we look at the amount of time we spent talking about a guy like Tukey getting these opportunities and then just falling on his face. And we just have this same conversation over and over again. These guys put themselves into that position and they've played so well and they've sustained it. Kyle Wright to me uh, is, I don't think he's the best story because my God, what, what the rookies are doing is incredible. But for a guy that entering the year, I mean, let's be real. We were all kind of tired of talking about this. It right. Was, it was, yeah, yeah, it was frustrating. It was frustrating for him. It was frustrating for the Braves. It was frustrating for media and fans that we're still talking. He was, if it was, if it was going to be another year like it had been, that he's in that two key zone. He's in that zone with these so, so many of these Bryce Wilson, these guys that just it was clear it's not going to work. He hasn't just popped. I mean, he has been beyond awesome and Mr. Consistency for them. And you look at this rotation, obviously Charlie kind of had the up and down year. You have still have Freed's reliability. But when you get Kyle Wright being a just – being just so like near a border, like frontline guy. And then you get Strider who looks like a, he looks like an ace. I mean, they're, I mean, they've gotten so much to go their way. They're in a really good spot. And, and that's a testament to these young guys. And it's a testament to the organization as a whole. Gabe, last thing for you, uh, the Kyle Wright thing, because this is going to be a fascinating discussion. You can make a case, obviously that Spencer Strider is your second best pitcher and come playoff time should get that spot. I know Snitker likes his veterans. He went with Dallas Keuchel over Mike Soroka, so you figure Charlie Morton gets in there. What's Kyle Wright's role going to be? You're talking about a, a, a guy who's going to be a 20-game winner that, let's face it, I mean, as good as it's been, you look at all the options because Freed's going to pitch game one, no doubt about that. But does that mean that Wright gets bumped over Strider and or Morton when it comes to Snitker coming up with this? His role there, in the playoffs is going to be very interesting. I mean, you know, Charlie's postseason record and the way they're going to view that, they're going to trust him and everything. Yeah. I'm Especially sorry. This manager, by the way, too. I mean, let, yeah. let's be honest. The way Snitker likes those kinds of guys, I don't see how he's going to bump Morton out of the rotation. I, I agree. And look, I understand the argument for Strider as a bullpen weapon. And I could totally see it. And it, believe me, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. At this point, I have a hard time not starting him. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I I think their playoff rotation is going to be the, the first thing to watch. It's going to be fascinating. So check out all of his work at AJC.com. You can follow him on Twitter at Gabe Burns AJC. Gabe is my buddy. And we appreciate it as always, Gabe, man. Thanks for spending a few minutes with me here on the podcast today. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks so much for making Hitting Hard with John Trucker your first listen every day. Make A to Z with Mark Zeno your second listen every day. Mark, back talking all things Atlanta sports. He's free and available on our YouTube page at Locked On Sports Atlanta. Subscribe there today. Also, download us for free on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify and Odyssey. Check us out. Amazon Fire, Roku, we're there as well. And follow me at JMCH316. We'll be back with you tomorrow. Hitting Hard with John Trucker, Locked On Sports Atlanta. 